All right, hello, fellas. Welcome back. I'm super excited for today's guest. It is Jeff Raby. Jeff was the former ambassador to China for Australia. Jeff has done a lot more than that as well. But as you'll see, his career has made him genuinely one of the biggest insiders into Chinese policy and economy, certainly from the perspective of an Australian, but also potentially globally. He'd be a, one of a handful of people who got to be there in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s throughout this amazing growth story of China. So to be precise, uh, Jeff Raby was the ambassador to China, Australia's ambassador to China from February 2007 until August 2011 and started his career as a diplomat in the nation with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as the head of the Chinese Embassy's Economic Division. Jeff has since moved into the private sector. He still sits in Beijing, but he clearly has throughout his career to this day a true insider's look into how this nation works, especially when it comes to its relationship with countries around the rest of the world. Now, obviously, China is the center of whatever globalization means, okay? They are the manufacturer of the world. So Jeff had and has this amazing perspective. And so I feel extremely lucky, to be frank, to having to, to getting to have spoken to him. And he was super generous with his time. We got an hour and a half in and we covered a lot of good stuff. Jeff has just published a new book. It's called China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the New Global Order. So it's definitely Australia Chinese centric. But look, if you're listening in, and as I can see from the analytics, you're spread from Iran to the US to Mexico to Argentina to Thailand. So <clears throat> you might be coming from around many different places in the world. But basically, with this chat, I get to speak with Jeff, like I said, one of the true insiders into how China works from what it was like to be the 80s, 90s, early 2000s in the huge transition that China went through. Him talking about it from an insider's perspective. Obviously, we touch on the Uyghur catastrophe that is happening in the Xinjiang province. We speak about the future of security in the South China Sea. We speak about Australia's uh, fumbling of soft power on the international stage. There's a lot of great stuff in this chat, and I was so thrilled and am so grateful that Jeff was uh, able to give us this time. So do the right thing by the man. Go and buy his book, China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the New Global Order. Terrific read if you have any sort of keen interest in geopolitics or an understanding of Australia and the international stage. It's absolutely required. And with that, I have to take this opportunity, obviously. You know what I have to do. I have to highlight the fact that it is a miracle verging on a miracle that I get to be speaking into your ears right now. Given the infinite distribution of the internet, the fact that you made it down to this tiny niche, which is my Geopolitics and Power podcast, it means we have more in common than we do not. Let's just make that assumption, which is me just saying, there are other things that I'm producing. The Curious Worldview, po- the Curious Worldview po- podcast is really a flagship. But then there's also a podcast about risk, randomness, and uncertainty. And there's also a lot of writing that's happening online. So I'm in this content creation space. The absolute hardest thing is discovery. And now it's a shit fight against the algorithm. But nonetheless, it's discovery. You and I have discovered each other already. But go over and check out the other stuff. Links are going to be in the description and just leave a review, write a little review, say something nice or don't, but just leave a review. Curious Worldview podcast. We just had on Stephen Hicks to do an hour on Nietzsche. He's going to come back and do a further hour on Nietzsche. This is a man who's been featured on Jordan Peterson's podcast. He wrote the handbook on postmodernism. That's just a flavor of what the other work that's happening over there. So check it out. Do your best to spread the good word and pump your good juice into the algorithm. It is us versus the algorithm. And with that, here is a truly exceptional man, Jeff Raby, the former ambassador to China for Australia. Mr. Jeff Raby, thank you so much for giving me some of your afternoon. You're on Chinese time. I'm on uh, Stockholm time. How are you? Very good. A bit warm in Beijing summer, but uh, otherwise good. Yeah, you were just telling me how uh, how piping hot it was over there. At what temperature yeah, yeah. are we talking? Yeah, it's only about 33 degrees, but it's just hot. And humid too? Uh, it, it, today it's humid this afternoon. Uh, we've had some uh-huh. nice dry days, which are much more uh, pleasant, of course. Yeah, sure. What's the, um, what, what's the city you're in? Beijing, you said. Beijing, yeah. And what's the air quality like there in the summer? It's been good all year. I mean, it, it may be yeah. because um, the economy is not running as hard as it used to because of COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, I've only been back in Beijing for two months. I had... 15 months uh, unexpected uh, stay in Australia. Uh, when yep. COVID hit, I was in Australia and 
it's hard to get out and I didn't know about coming back. But in the two months I've been here, the air quality has been really good. And, you know, uh, the Chinese are taking um, issues of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and quality of air and so on quite seriously, as you see. Yeah, so, so, you, so is reported, uh, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Um, let's, let's kick off into the first set of questions. So I obviously have prepared after going through your book. But then as I was going uh, through the book, um, it, uh, uh, my interest really went to sort of yourself and maybe what you were doing before you were the ambassador to China. Um, and so I just want to sort of start there. Before you were Australia's ambassador to China, how did your understanding of both China and also Australia change after you stepped into the diplomatic position and sort of got to see the, the bureaucracy firsthand and behind the curtains firsthand? Well, right. For me, it wasn't such a um, uh, a big step because I'd been a professional diplomat for 27 years, and in fact, I first came to China in 1986. Now, I'm quite unusual because uh, I didn't join the diplomatic corps, which was a separate service in those days in mm -hmm. Australia, but rather came through one of the intelligence agencies, the Office of National Assessments, and I was recruited because, although I I'm not a Sinologist, I never have been, and make no claim to being a Sinologist, and my Chinese is still terrible. Uh, I've got a PhD in economics, and uh, I was a professional economist, uh, academic, with an interest in the reform of centrally planned economies. And okay. not really China, but more Eastern Europe uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and the Soviet Union in those days. Um, and I, I went to Beijing for one year, I was transferred into the foreign ministry, went to one year, for one year just to help to build a professional economic reporting capacity in the embassy. In those days, foreign affairs had no economist. And one thing led to another, and, and foreign affairs was amalgamated with trade and just became a normal part of the public service. And I ended up spending five remarkable years from 1986 to 91 in China. Mm. Um, and so, roll the clock forward, and I was deputy secretary, uh, what others would call a vice minister, in our ministry before coming to Beijing, but working on North Asia and China very closely for a number of years before coming to Beijing. And, uh, and uh, to that end, that I was very familiar and exposed to the workings of the Chinese system and uh, high-level diplomacy. For example, yeah. I, started the, uh, I initiated and started the work on the free trade agreement going back all the way to 2003. Um, and uh, that took a lot of uh, diplomatic engagement uh, to get the Chinese to think about doing a free trade agreement with a developed country like Australia. They had simply not considered that in those days as a possibility. Really? Yeah. yeah. Really? That's fascinating. Okay. Totally. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. And I, I'd previously come off the back of being Australia's ambassador to the World Trade Organization and very much involved with China in their accession to the WTO, which finally took place in October 2001. And, um, and uh, it, it, we had just done an FTA with the United States and I said to Foreign Minister Howard, uh, Foreign Minister Downer and Prime Minister Howard, um, we should be doing one of these with China. And they said, yeah, go for it. So I went up to Beijing and Beijing had no bilateral FTAs at that time, had never mm -hmm. really considered it. And was mm -hmm. still in the process of economically and particularly politically digesting their WTO accession. And today, you know, everyone sees the WTO accession for China as a major success. But back then in 2003, it was still within the Chinese system, politically very contentious. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to go and then talk about doing an FTA with a country like Australia, uh, and of course, China's economy was nowhere near as big relative to Australia in those days, just seemed mm -hmm. to be something out of... Um, uh, were way out of consideration, as I used to describe it to people. My conversations initially, when I went to Beijing, was like trying to explain what life was like on Mars. Um, but finally, we got there, and they agreed to start an FTA with us. It's absolutely amazing, Jeff. I can only imagine how exciting it would have been and almost adventurous as well to get to China in the sort of mid 80s and not only be there as, as a foreigner, as an Australian, because that alone would have been incredible. But coupled into that, you had a position of influence and power and you got to oversee what I'm sure is you know, one of the most uh, 
remarkable um, economic turnarounds in history. Now you're sort of there after it already had the wheels had been moving, but you were nonetheless there during a huge growth stage. So I would I ask you to reflect on how much you romanticize those early days um, versus maybe what China is now for you as because it, it's now your home. Maybe it's you know it, it's lost that touch of charm. Uh, do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, right. It's a, it's a really nice question, actually, um, because there's two elements to it. Um, uh, one is sort of the how how one feels, your feelings about the place, and it was an incredibly romantic time back then. I mean, for local people in Beijing, it was tough times. Um, mm. They were very poor. Uh, conditions were not very good. People lived in crowded hutongs, um, uh, burned coal inside small unventilated rooms to cook with and then in winter to heat with. Uh, toilets were public toilets and you would find them uh, more by the smell than the light that in the evenings it would lead you to them because there's very little electricity, there were no, almost no one had a phone, mm -hmm. everyone rode bicycles. But as a foreigner who had a privileged life and comfortable conditions, it was a marvelously romantic time. And even as diplomats, we would just ride our bicycles around the streets, uh, winter or summer, um, and uh, go into the little hutongs and eat locally. And there was so much street life and character to Beijing in those days. And today, of course, it's a very different world. I mean, it's a city of 25 million people, uh, very high per capita income. Uh, in those days, the third ring road was the sort of outer limit of the city. And no one ever went beyond the third ring road. You felt as if you'd drop off the face of the earth if you did. And now, you know, you've got six ring roads and it's so vast and spread out and there are hardly any bicycles and on and on it goes. So in that sense, it's lost that incredible romantic feeling that I was lucky enough to experience. Yeah. Uh, but it was going to go with the uh, onset of economic growth and rising prosperity. But that leads to the other dimension of it because then um, I was one of very few, I think, economists that had a view of China that if they did what they were saying they were going to do in terms of economic reform and open door policy, that the potential for China to grow was enormous. And it didn't matter if it called itself communist or not. It didn't matter if private property was owned privately or collectively. What mattered was that if they unleashed the force of the market, the place would just take off. Mm. And in a sense, that's what happened. And like in the 80s, I was often regarded as um, extremely optimistic about the outlook for China. Yeah. And all I can say is that China has far, far, far exceeded my wildest optimism. Um, well, they so, took everyone by surprise, didn't they? Sorry, right? They've taken everyone by surprise, haven't they? Yeah, no, absolutely, including themselves, which I think is an important element in understanding where China is today, and including... In my book, I, I uh, talk a lot about um, China's resource dependency, mm -hmm. uh, raw materials, uh, crude oil, gas, and so on. And China never, ever, Chinese leadership in their wildest dreams, never, ever expected to be finding themselves rich and at the same time utterly dependent on world markets for everything they need. And with yeah. that has come enormous strategic vulnerability which they're still struggling with today yeah and just to compound on that and foreshadowing for what we'll get into later maybe a little bit of a head scratcher as to why they behave the way they do on the geopolitical scene sometimes because they are reliant at the end of the day uh, as you rightly point out uh, specifically with energy dependency they might be able to be self-sustaining on pretty much everything else but if you don't have the first variable input you know you may as well you, you, you're good as dead um Absolutely. There's so there's so many places I'd like to take it. Uh, I, I just want to maybe say, what what about Australia's relationship when you first went there? So you you, um, you said before how you were involved in the creation of this free trade agreement uh, with Australia, but was it always going to be the case that Australia would inevitably supply a lot of the energy for China's growth, or were there other countries that could have just as easily gotten those super lucrative contracts? Uh, energy. Um, is you know, more competitive uh, than um, iron ore and coal and other resources. And mm. uh, where 
for, for Australia, it's really been very much a mineral story. Okay. Uh, when I first I, went I did there, mean energy as in coal and yeah, um, but, 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 but minerals, okay. yeah. I need to make that distinction because, I mean, obviously crude oil comes from the Middle East uh, and China is, is the world's largest uh, importer of crude oil and has been for some time. And it's an important part of the story. Uh, but, but with minerals, Australia was extraordinarily well placed. And this is the prescience, if you like, of former Prime Minister Bob Hawke and his coterie of advisors. And that's ultimately what got me to Beijing on my first posting to build the economic capacity of the embassy. I said Hawke came and he sat down and he listened to Hu Yobang, who was then General Secretary, and Zhao Ziyang, who was uh, uh, Premier. And they laid out the Deng Xiaoping vision for reform. And essentially the message he took away was that these Chinese leaders had no intention for China to continue to be poor and backwards and isolated from the world. That they were fair dinkum, they really meant what they said. Now, whether they could go as far as they, they dreamt was another matter. But sure. Hawke understood from the early 80s, unlike almost no other world leader, that uh, China would do much of what it intended to do. And if it did even only half of what it said it wanted to do, the implications for Australia through the nexus of the resources and energy trade would be profound. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely what's happened. So uh, China's first ever overseas investment was in an iron ore project in Western Australia called Mount Chana. Okay. And that First happened. Really, That's great. Yeah, and that really happened because Hawke just prevailed upon them. But at the okay. time, the Chinese never, Chinese leadership could not imagine uh, becoming dependent on foreign markets for iron ore. They had lots mm -hmm. of iron ore. China is, in terms of resource endowment, an incredibly rich country. That's why mm -hmm. for 3,000 years it's been quite insular and inward looking and hasn't really had to engage the rest of the world. I mean, rem remember the Opium War of 1840. That was because China didn't actually want to trade anything with the rest of the world. So the British basically introduced opium, forced addiction on the Chinese people. And then to pay for the opium, China had to, um, had to use its silver. And that was to balance the rundown on the British silver reserves because, China, uh, because the British were consuming so much tea from China. China never needed to trade. It was rich, vast country, rich in resources. And that was true until as recently as the mid 90s. And this is an extremely important point to understand, which I really go through at length in the book. And up until the mid 90s, they're self-sufficient even in crude oil. And then from the mid 90s, as they start to get richer, they start to turn uh, more and more to international markets to keep the wheels of the economy going. Mm -hmm. And in the 2000s, China goes from being self-sufficient or a small importer to becoming the world's largest net importer of nearly everything it needs. Yeah, and, it wow, drives, it? Yeah, and it drives the super resource cycle of the first decade mm -hmm. of the 21st century. And it happens in an incredibly short time. Even to the point now where they've maybe overshot their uh, imports by so much that they have to now construct outside of China just to maintain the resources as they're coming in so they don't almost spoil or go to waste. Um, well, certainly so they want to diversify supply. Yeah, well, certainly they want to diverse supply and they've become utterly dependent mm -hmm. on Australia, for example, for iron ore. And from a security point of view, that's not a comfortable place for them to be. Mm. And, 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 you know, you, you can understand things like the South China Sea in terms of China's um, sense of existential threat from its, 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 its um, dependence on foreign suppliers. Nearly everything goes through the South China Sea. And, of course, the U.S. still maintains by far naval superiority, superiority in that area. Mm. And uh, the U.S. could close that area in a heartbeat. So it's sure. not a surprise that China's very focused on these sea lanes, not to block trade, but the contrary, the contrary mm -hmm. to what's popularly asserted, to keep trade flowing, mm -hmm. because it's absolutely dependent on trade flowing through those uh, waters. Isn't that also the underlying incentive of the BRI Belt and Road Initiative? China wants to almost take back ownership of certain trade routes because they can't rely on the US uh, allowing for that order 
very much this is so. also foreshadowing, but nonetheless. Yeah, but very much so. I think the genesis of the BRA is in uh, Beijing realising its strategic vulnerability on the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea, which by strategic thinkers in Beijing often has been referred to as the boot on China's throat. That's how seriously it's taken. To try and find alternative, yeah, to try and find alternative routes, uh, and it won't. It's not a surprise, supply route. It's not a surprise that one of the earliest BRI projects started even before Xi Jinping started talking about the BRI in Astana in Kazakhstan in 2013. Uh, was a gas and oil pipeline across Burma, going from Kunming across Burma to the um, Indian Ocean. And this is the first time once oil and gas started flowing through that in 2015 that uh, China has been able to receive oil from the Middle East without having to go through the Straits of Malacca. Mm. I mean, it underscores the, 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 the need for transport route diversification from a strategic driven point of view. And then the BRIs have obviously morphed into much more than that, but its mm -hmm. genesis is very much as you describe it, right? Interesting. Um, and I definitely do want to dig into the BRI with you later and maybe some of China's debt trap diplomacy and so forth. But I don't want to leave behind a few points that you made. What, what do you think it was that made Bob Hawke so sort of confident and willing to take this risk with China? Was it simply a case of it was a very asymmetric bet for him to make because there wasn't much to lose? Um, or was it just, was there something more to it? It's an interesting way of looking at it. I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but I, I think there's something more to it than, than that uh, there was little downside. Um, you know, he, he had a vision of, um, of humanity, as it were. I mean, he was a, a democratic socialist. He'd studied um, politics, economic and philosophy at Oxford. He had you know, absorbed all those values, and he believed, um, a bit like Deng Xiaoping, that uh, to get rich was glorious um, and that poverty was not socialism. And he felt that himself in his own socialist values that he brought to politics in Australia. And I think he projected them onto China. And, and what he found in China, if you like, was the perfect um, uh, mirror image, if you like, of his own views, but, but, a, but a canvas you know, vastly greater than Australia's. But he, he, I mean, he just believed. He believed that's what people did. And, uh, and, and I think it's uh, really driven by values of democratic socialism. So you're almost suggesting that Bob Hawke might have had even a, a political philosophy influence over the direction that China took. Or is that too much to assert? No, that's, that, that's too much. I, I, think, um, I, I think the point I'm making is that they had made up their mind what they wanted to do and needed to do. Mm. And then Hawke turns up on his first meeting as Prime Minister in China and they lay all this out to him. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just rung bells. You know, the, Deng Xiaoping's pragmatism in politics. Um, as I said, the belief that um, uh, poverty was not socialism. Mm. Those sorts of things, exactly the sorts of arguments separately and unconnected to China that Hawke himself had been arguing in sure. the Labour movement in Australia for decades. So, so it, was just, it was, they saw like minds more or less, or yeah. similar idea of the Absol world, similar world. Absol absolutely, absolutely. And, um, the other, sorry, and the other thing about Hawke, and very much like the Chinese leadership at the time, is Hawke was not idealistic, uh, sorry, not ideological, not ideological. He was definitely idealistic, but he was not ideological. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't matter if you had labels like communism uh, attached to the project or socialism of Chinese characteristics. Um, he saw things in very pragmatic terms. And I think that was extremely important. And I emphasize the point for a particular reason. I think his pragmatism influenced us as diplomats to be much more open-minded about what was going on in China in those early days than any of our other colleagues in any other embassy. Nearly all the other embassies view China through a much more ideological prism than we did. Okay. 
was it also maybe like a, an imperialism hangover where there was still the idea that you were there as a um, you know, better, superior country and culture to sort of oversee this uh, developing nation? Was there also those influences that might have stopped a lot of people from recognizing potential in China? Oh, absolutely. Uh, particularly yeah. for Europeans at the time. Yeah, I can imagine uh, the English diplomats sort of strolling around. Yep, yeah, <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. No, and absolutely. And 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 it was uh, there was a European racial arrogance to to China, um, mm -hmm. but you know, Australians, being a sort of frontier society, didn't bring that, and a, and a, 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 a colony rather than a colonizer didn't bring that to the relationship either. So we're much freer, much more open. Um, and, and I think we had tremendous engagement in those years because of that. The Americans uh, are interesting because they don't, they don't have anywhere a sense of um, superiority that the Europeans bring to the relationship. But, but the difference with the Americans, they don't bring that sense of superiority, um, but they have a much stronger ideological position and did have in, in all those years and even today and that derives from this notion of US exceptionalism mm -hmm. no matter how hard they try and leave it behind them it's so deeply ingrained and particularly yeah. ingrained in the State Department land of the free and home of the brave exactly it's and we're going to make you like DNA. we're going to do a big yeah. favour and make you like us we're yeah. really going <laughs> to exactly. yeah. help you yeah yeah. So, guys, so I have an idea that'll actually improve. You do, you be more like us, and you'll be better. Believe me. Yeah, exactly. So Australia found itself in a fairly unique position, mm -hmm. an advanced, developed Western capitalist country, a liberal democracy, that didn't bring past notions of ethnic superiority or ideological purity into the relationship. And they were great years, really, to be a diplomat in China from Australia. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had real influence. Um, most countries didn't take China anywhere near as seriously as we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, people used to stand back and admire how we managed the relationship with China. Yeah. Well, it is. it can't be understated, can it, uh, the sort of early relationship and policies that, that, that glued China and Australia together because it's responsible for our incredible standard of living. Um, I say our, both of us aren't in our own country, but nonetheless, yeah, Australia's absolutely. incredible standard of living. It's, it's, yeah. um, it's one of the best places to live in the world and largely due to the fact that we are a great customer to a great buyer. Yeah, <laughs> and, nicely um, expressed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously the themes of your book is Australia-Chinese uh, relationship and dynamic. And, and, I, and we do want to get into that, but before... Um, we go there. I just want to round out your years uh, as an economist diplomat before the ambassador. And a huge undercurrent of uh, China's success is their uh, successful economic zones, special economic zones. So it sounds like, from my understanding of special economic zones in China, you were there alongside the development of these projects. I just would love to ask as an insider what your thoughts of special economic zones are, and you can say specifically in China, but then also maybe um, paint a bit of reality to them beyond just the superficial understanding that one might have. Well, it's funny you ask the story. I don't think I tell this anecdote in the book I forget now. But uh, my very first trip to China was 1985, a year before I went there as first secretary in the embassy on a posting. And I was sent uh, there largely because, uh, partly familiarization, because I was working on the Chinese economy, but part, uh, largely because Prime Minister Hawke wanted to understand what was going on with these special economic zones. So I went to Shenzhen, which is now you know, the richest city in China and richer per mm. capita than Hong Kong even. And a special economic zone. A special economic zone, and uh, in those days they had fences around them to stop people coming in and out. Really? And coming okay. from Hong Kong, it was, it was a really complicated thing. You had to get a train to the Hong Kong border, Hong Kong China border. You then had to walk along a, a reinforced um, wire fenced long platform, mm -hmm. and then do customs again and, and passport at the other side and get checked into Shenzhen. And there wasn't much, you know, we had no infrastructure there. We had a good consulate in, um, uh, consul general in um, uh, Hong Kong, but no infrastructure in southern China. So um, someone from the consulate came along with me and we 
pre-arranged some dodgy Australian businessman to take us around for some vast fee to show us what was going on. And I only spent, I mean, there wasn't really much accommodation. I only spent a day there. I didn't even stay overnight. But I ended up, after visiting many, many companies in a very hot, steamy, sticky day in May of um, 1985, uh, many companies, and came away concluding that the whole thing was going to be a disaster. And it, it could not work, it could not succeed, and it was a great misallocation of scarce capital. Well, um, Why is that? Why did you get that impression? Well, I mean, just the way it looked. There were muddy fields everywhere. Uh, there were power blackouts every second day, power rationing. Um, okay. there, there, you know, there was yeah. almost nothing, but there was a three-quarters built amusement park okay. and a sort of luxury hotel with a golf course, all okay. muddy fields. So you got the impression and that this was just a couple of multinationals just dodgy, taking time for a ride? Well, right? no, just dodgy characters everywhere, including okay. a strange <laughs> guy taking us around. Um, and, that of course... Um, uh, it, it just seemed to be that um, land wasn't a constraining factor in China in those days, but they're going to they're going to go for this high-rise development, which seemed also uh, not what Economics 101 would teach you to to um, think. But you know, it just goes to the sort of long-term vision the Chinese leadership has taken to these projects, and uh, I was wrong, and the leadership was was right, and mm -hmm. you know, Shenzhen is what it is today. But you know. For China, the special economic, zone, economic zones were extremely important because, and they still are today, like the, the Greater Bay Area, uh, linking Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou. Uh, they use these, these areas to experiment in policies. Mm -hmm. And they do it quite rigorously and seriously. So always, if you look at China, the thing to understand most is that you know, the leadership, by and large, knows what it should do in terms of markets or... Uh, liberalization or whatever there, but but it, there's always a trade-off between economic efficiency and stability and stability trumps everything so the special economic zones perform this incredibly important function and especially then to try things out and see what happens without uh, any generalized catastrophe occurring to the rest of the country Interesting. and then over yeah. time they generalize uh, the lessons from those experiences. So uh, with other countries, it can be, you know, it can be different because with other countries, the zones sort of never grow up. They just uh, become uh, export enclaves. Yeah. And, and their benefits don't, uh, are not diffused to the rest of the, the economy. But I think uh, China's managed to use these zones as a way of reforming the whole economy and, and therefore deriving economy-wide benefits. It sounds like, because the, um, there's, I think it's two and a half thousand of the 6,000 special economic zones in the world are Chinese. They're like a, they're a function, they're an outgrowth of globalization. I think 60% of the world's trade moves through them and 50% of the world's manufacturing. And obviously mm. most of those segments of the pie come from China. Maybe S special economic zones worked in China because, as you say, the state could iterate trial and error there and, and like have the robustness to suffer whatever inefficiency came back, whereas most other special economic zones around the world are famously independent and maybe the yes. state is involved in the creation but certainly not the overseeing and therefore they don't get to iterate with the same bounds, you know, they, yeah. they have to operate within a much tighter risk blanket. Then maybe that's why China's could succeed, and um, that's fascinating. What about some of the benefits that you saw through the special economic zones? You know, uh, like how, how crucial are these to China's success? Yeah, as I said, I mean, it, it enabled policy experimentation and development, and then generalization um, of those policies to the rest of the economy, and that was extremely important. I mean, today there's no fences between the rest of China and the special economic zones. People can move in and out uh, freely. Uh, there's no, you know, you've got the hooko issue, but the hooko issue permits to live somewhere um, tied to where you were born is true for wherever you are in China. Um, as I said, back in the old days, you had huge barbed wire fences to stop people getting into the special economic zone. Yeah. So they're not, they're, they're, they're not isolated from the wider economy uh, any longer, but they still have, at times, 
uh, special economic um, uh, privileges in terms of tax or whatever. I mean, a few years ago, five years ago or something, Shanghai developed one. Um, and it's, 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 it's sort of a regulatory tax light area that attracts okay. a lot of foreign investment and capital. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've been, I think, a big part of the, the story. But nothing's been as big, I think, for the whole Chinese growth story as um, uh, extending the market, strengthening property rights, um, encouraging the development of the private economy, which now accounts for two thirds of China's GDP, which is astonishing. Yeah, true. Um, and using state funds to invest massively in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Just since you brought it up, um, could you comment on China's future grappling with the middle income trap? Um, because, as you just said, two thirds of the economy is two thirds of the economy is domestic, and that creates a whole different set of incentives and problems when maybe one third of the economy is domestic. Yeah, but you see now, I mean, China has very very high savings rates, and I think that's going to be 60% of GDP or something. So it's, it's, it's going to be a big factor in getting China over the middle uh, income trap. Um, and for the last six or eight years, uh, domestic demand has become increasingly the main driver of economic growth. Okay. And it now accounts for over 45% of economic growth. I mean, there was a time just after the GFC when they had massive government fiscal stimulus, um, 2010, 11, 12, when investment accounted for over 65% of mm -hmm. GDP growth. So I think there's all the conditions there for China to get over the middle um, income trap. But there's another point I'd like to make, which again, never seems to come out much in discussions of China, of China's economy. You've got to think of China as like sort of um, a lot of different sized pancakes on top of each other. So there's the eastern seaboard, the big cities, mm -hmm. uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. I can reel off more. Qingdao, mm -hmm. Dalian, Ningbo, uh, Hangzhou, and so it goes. And, and, and the whole provinces of Zhejiang and Jiangsu, we put all that together and you're talking about sort of 250 million people with almost developed levels of per capita income. Mm -hmm. So whilst on the national average, China's still in the lower to middle middle income area, 250 million people are already at developed country levels of per capita income. Mm -hmm. And then you can find through the center of China down to the southwest, starting in the northeast, you know, maybe another six, seven hundred million people that are at the emerging market levels of per capita income. And then another 500 or so, well, that's too many, 300, two to 300, um, which are at the less developed levels of per capita income. So this provides enormous opportunities for catch up at all the different levels of development. Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising, say, that Shanghai's growth rate is, um, is uh, you know, averages about three and a half percent. That's like a high rate of growth for a developed economy. And that's what you expect, that Shanghai is largely a services-based economy. That's what you expect. It is developed. Mm. It's been achieved. So for a huge chunk of the Chinese economy, it already has gone past the middle income trap. Um, and so a lot of these generalizations and things are very difficult to hold up. But then, you know, another way of looking at it is that, uh, you know, the numbers aren't exact and the timing's not exact, but. Like in the early 2000s, Chongqing, which is a population of 30 million people, and Shanghai is about 22 million people, uh, Shanghai's per capita income was something like 32 times higher than Chongqing. And today it's about eight times higher. Mm -hmm. So, so at Chongqing, the extremes, the country is even so. Yeah, it's. It, it, you know, and, 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 and you know, I would throw Chengdu in uh, the capital of Sichuan province in the southwest into the mix of already developed economies. So a lot of these generalizations might make sense if you're looking at uh, you know, the Philippines or Thailand, for example, um, or you know, Chile perhaps, but they don't make sense 
when you're looking at a vast continental sized economy like China's. Mm. And you it's also. Allow, no, go on, please, saying, go on. You, have, you just have to allow for massive regional differences. And in a country of this size, uh, these aren't marginal sometimes. They're, they're, they're so big, they're a difference of kind. Yeah. And it's also worth taking into account that most of the wealth that you just highlighted lives east of the the who line or something where two-thirds of the population lives in one third of the land and that's also the agricultural hotbed of the country that's where all of those eastern seaboard prosperous cities that you mentioned were it, it could also just be like a just a, a victim or symptom of the geography of the nation since it is so big uh, yeah. and most of the development happens in a certain area that they get to develop much faster than the rest but i guess the i, I think with the middle income trap i don't know it, it's a it's a it's it might just be another sort of you know over academic sort of economic way to explain something that's actually far more complex than whatever the simple statistical you know model that you might have thought worked in another country with a middle income trap that might have yeah. worked in china yeah um uh let's let's i really wanted to ask you this one this is a bit of a personal one um when you were serving as australia's ambassador to china i imagine that the complexity of the different incentives that you faced would have been sometimes overwhelming because you have your own geopolitical and economic understanding of the world you're on the ground in china you feel like you can actually see the good path that you want to be taking but nonetheless um as the ambassador to china you're you're operating at the whim of whatever australia's politics of the day were you know like how often did you did you disagree with the policy that you had to enforce or, or at least lobby for or how would the terminology goes? No, look, it, it's a great question. I mean, you're, you're there to advance and protect Australia's interest. That's absolutely fundamental to your job. But sometimes, because you have the local knowledge and you're on the ground, you do that by actually trying to persuade Canberra or your capital um, uh, of your point of view. Mm. And there's often uh, an ongoing dialogue. It was okay in my days because uh, pretty much everyone was, was, was aligned, but also I'd already had a fairly substantial influence on thinking in Canberra about China because of the previous roles I had, particularly as Deputy Secretary. Um, and so um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, look, it's a constant dialogue with your capital. And uh, often ambassadors, when they sit around together, uh, the thing they really have in common is that they're all frustrated by the capitals. Complaining about the capital. Yeah. <laughs> You're not complaining about your host. You're complaining about your capital at home. Sure, sure. That's quite funny. I, 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 I sort of thought as much as well, but I, I can just imagine, and it, it applies to really any sort of personal and political position, right? I mean, mm. they have their idea of the world, and it turns out that rather than getting to enact it, the whole time it's just been trying to convince others that it's the right idea, and then yeah. in the middle of all of that and the bureaucracy, it's just nothing happens sometimes. Right? I can imagine it's so frustrating. And that's one reason why countries usually send very senior diplomats to places like China. Because you really do not only need to have weight in Beijing, but you really need to have weight back home. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to know how to manage the bureaucracy back home, how to get your views through the bureaucracy, and how to influence people both through formal and informal channels. Uh, can you make a quick commentary on bureaucracy as a more general point? As someone who's existed in a political system, which is arguably the most sort of bureaucratic system that we have, humanity's created, like, do you have this sort of internal... Do, what, what does bureaucracy do to your blood? Does it boil it a bit, or do you, like, understand that it's a necessary function of life? Well, the latter. Of the latter, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, Australia has been well served. Um, uh, by its by its uh, its bureaucrats, uh, uh, I think what boils my blood is when politicians don't understand that, and mm. politicians seek to politicise the nature of bureaucratic advice, and I really feel that's where we are in Australia these days. But look, I left academia principally uh, when I joined the public service because I wanted to be part of that bureaucracy, the Australian Commonwealth Public Service. Mm -hmm. um, it's an absolutely dedicated bunch of highly professional people who work with the politicians to not only implement their policy but to help politicians develop policies which are in the best interest of Australia. And it's fact-based, it's you know, evidence-based and all of that. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I, I had the great fortune, putting the China stuff to one side, I had the great fortune to be part of the bureaucracy when we reformed and opened the Australian economy itself. When we got rid of our tariffs, when we liberalised our financial sector, when we opened up Australia to foreign banks, when we reformed the labour market, when we did all of those things that made Australia such a resilient, dynamic economy. And, and, and the bureaucracy had a massive role to play in that. Mm -hmm. um, as well, of course, the, uh, we had excellent political leaders in those years. All right, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Australia then, because we've obviously had a lot about China. Um, but just to maybe fill in the gap between then, um, you, could you explain what years you were the ambassador and then what you've been doing since you left up until this point and as the context for us to speak about Australia's relationship with China and, and the themes of your book and so forth? So uh, I, I, I went to Beijing as ambassador at the beginning of 2007 and finished uh, 10 years ago uh, in the end of July 2011. And um, uh, that was four and a half years uh, in the job. Uh, it's a longish time for an Australian ambassador. It wasn't necessarily a reflection of my abilities. It was more a result of Kevin Rudd's inability to work out who he wanted to replace me. So I was fortunate to get a slightly longer posting than most people could expect. Nice. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's the years I, I was there. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit about maybe Australia's uh, soft power because we sort of famously punch above our weight when it comes to this. You know, we're a, uh, on the global scheme of things, very small economy and country, and but nonetheless, we have this sort of strong soft power throughout the world. What, what, what does this come down to? And I'm leaning into then you speaking about the relationship specifically with China. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I'm not sure we have as much soft power these days as we, we once did. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, you know, we are a, a, a successful, liberal, open, democratic uh, country, and people admire that about us. Uh, but in diplomatic terms, we once were very active in working with like-minded countries to build coalitions around issues that would advance our interest as well as advancing the interests of the global system. Mm -hmm. And we actually we're proud of the fact that we pursued policies uh, of what we would call good international citizenship. Yeah. Now, conservatives don't like people saying that, but good international citizenship serves our interests as well. So, for example, in the years when I wasn't in the, in the China world, um, I was leading our trade negotiations for many years. And one of the things that was created well before my time was a thing called the Cairns Group of Agricultural Trading Nations, it ran a 20-odd you know, year campaign to liberalise world agriculture. Now, we, we chaired that and led that uh, for all those years. And the interest certainly advanced our farmers' interests to, to get better access to other markets and have higher prices because there's less subsidies. But we were a group of developing countries. I mean, we were a developed country, Australia, but most of the members of the Cairns group are developing country. So as we advanced our own interests, we advanced global interests, and particularly interests of developing countries. And that sort of leadership in the world, that we gave leadership on this issue, and we had to devote the resources to it, and ministers had to give the time and focus and attention and so on. But that, you know, was what built our if you like, soft power, our capacity to influence events to an extent more than you'd expect for a country of our size. Um, and we did other things. Uh, Gareth Evans and the uh, Indonesian Foreign Minister, Ali Alatas, they worked out a resolution to the Cambodian conflict at the end of the Vietnam, well, later in the end of the Vietnam War, in the, um, in the uh, early 90s. Um, but this really was uh, a very strong example of how working with like-minded countries, coalition building, persistent patient diplomacy, we could affect change. We created APEC. And, you know, you don't just drop these things uh, overnight and they happen. But we, ha we, we had governments of both political persuasions that for many, many years were prepared to put the resources in, have the imagination uh, to back the civil servants, to back the bureaucrats and the diplomats. And that's why we were 
you know, so influential globally, as you say, while we punched above our weight. Mm. But I've seen very, very little evidence of that in the last decade or so. Do you and have a theory? I'm, I'm no longer in the system. I, you know, it just maybe, that's why. Evidence, but do you have a theory as to why that happened? Is it sort of less like-minded countries, or is this really firmly rooted to Australia's politics? Well, to be fair to everyone, the, the, the world's much, much more complex today than it was when we were doing many of the things we did. Yeah. Um, so the degree of difficulty is that much greater. But I, I just don't think we have had um, the political leadership in Australia for a very long time to do these things. Probably the last thing we influenced significantly, and it was really the personality and drive of the Prime Minister at the time, Kevin Rudd, uh, was to create the G20. Uh, now, G20 wasn't our creation as such. There was going to be a need with the global financial crisis for some combination of group of countries more than the then G7 or G8. Mm -hmm. And Rudd made sure through very persuasive and persistent diplomacy that we would be part of that bigger group. And in doing so, I think we played a fairly important role in the final outcome of the G20. Now, today, whether the G20 is worth having or not is another question. But you know, I think that is probably, probably the last example I can think of where our international diplomacy has uh, produced um, uh, some you know, worthwhile result on the global stage. Is, could an explanation for why there's more complexity now and why Australia does have less soft power, if we assume the like political ambition in Australia equal over time, which maybe it's not, but if we assume that, could it be the case that there is now less developing nations, more developed nations, and therefore maybe it's much harder for Australia to compete as one of the uh, successful democracies in the world? because now there is just more of them, you know? Uh, is that a fair, uh, like, a theory to have, or is that a bit, a bit bad? Well, the, the, I think, I think the, the, the global index of democracy would show that there's probably less democracy in the world today than there was 15 years ago. So, no, um, uh, I mean, the world is a much more complex place. Uh, you don't have... Um, it, it's no longer, as I talk about in my book, a unipolar world, it's a multipolar world. Uh, many of the influential powers in the world today are not democracies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it is a world in which much harder to do the sorts of things we might want to do uh, than in the past. But I still think, look, um, where there are issues of common interest, and I think you see it on climate change, I think global cooperation for, on climate change is, is getting stronger and stronger. And I think uh, China has contributed to that with its uh, commitment to zero greenhouse targets, uh, zero, uh, to zero targets by 2060. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, I just don't think Australia has had the political leadership to commit itself to putting the effort and resources into that type of um, of, uh, of uh, foreign policy. If you take that green environmental policy specifically, what's a good example? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah. I, I was going to say it, it could be all sorts of things. I mean, we could have taken, we could have played a much bigger leadership role with the pandemic, and we should have played a much bigger leadership role with the pandemic. But for some reason, known only to himself. The Prime Minister came out in public and blurted out, blurted out the need for an independent inquiry, mm -hmm. effectively pointing the finger at China and basically fracturing any, any hope of building an international consensus about this issue mm -hmm. by, by pointing an accusing finger at China. Um, and, and, and our role in this has just been completely marginal as a result. What would you have had the current Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison do? I would, have, did. I would have him talk to as many like-minded countries um, and pick up the phone to uh, any number of European and developing country and Latin American country, Southeast Asian country leaders and say, look, you know, we need to get the bottom of this, this is terrible and we need a collective voice internationally 
to mm-hmm. call for some some inquiry through the WHO. Mm-hmm. But instead, he just went solo to try and be maybe too bravado about it. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, and 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 and, and at a time when the tension between Washington and Beijing was at its most extreme, where President Trump was talking about the Wuhan flu and the Beijing virus and the China pandemic, you know, mm-hmm. it could not have been worse. And these, you know, dipl- in diplomacy, it's an old cliche, but words are bullets. And, and diplomacy is not about how loud you talk or speak. Okay. It's about getting the outcomes you want. Sure. They're being an operator, right? Yeah, making things happen in your own interest. You're not much of an operator, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's well, a disaster. Well, you've definitely taken us to the next point very well. Uh, you write in the third part of the book about Australia's dystopian future. Um, in the context of Australia and China's relationship, it seems we are really at a for maybe historically, but for a very long time, a low in our relationship. What has taken us here? Um, Because it was still going downhill before Scott Morrison called for the investigation earlier in the year. But what has, could you explain our relationship's deterioration and then also what you sort of describe as a dystopian future? Okay, well, on the the relationship, uh, it needs to be seen in the big context of the US um, about eight years ago or so uh, reassessing the rise of China and realizing that China is not going to become uh, like the US, uh, that that they're not going to become a liberal open democratic system, but that they will grow and become a major economic and military power Mm -hmm. and therefore threaten US global dominance. And all that's happened. And um, it is just a fact of uh, history that dominant powers will resist ascended powers. And the US changed its position around 2016, 2017 to view China uh, not as a country with which the US engaged, but as one that it seek, that one that it sought to resist and to push back on, and even to go so far as to attempt to contain. Okay. Now, Australia, partly because of its formal ANZUS alliance with the US, but really, I think it's more sociological because of the personal and institutional and professional mm. connections. Cultural between our, Yeah, between our military, industrial um, and defense establishments and the Americans, that we decisively adopted the view that China was a strategic competitor of Australia. Now, it's not. We're not a dominant power. It's not threatening our status as it is the US. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unlike Japan, we have no territorial issues and no issues of history. Mm -hmm. And certainly unlike India, no territorial issues. Mm -hmm. China is not a strategic competitor of Australia and nor is it an existential threat to Australia. But we have now, for the last five or six years, adopted policies to that effect. So they have framed, that if you like, MetaView has framed the decisions and actions in each individual specific case that's caused grievance and made the Chinese leadership lose face. Mm -hmm. So with Huawei, we were the first to ban Huawei comprehensively. The British only did it last year and only after enormous pressure from the United States. Germany still hasn't. Japan is very ambivalent about what it's doing. Um, But we were out there first, the loudest mouth. We did it comprehensively. And, you know, if you look at the language, oh, you know, you just can't trust the Chinese government. You can't trust them. So we've got to ban it completely. Mm. Um, Then there's the um, then there's the foreign interference law um, that uh, Malcolm Turnbull brought in. It's supposed to be non-discriminatory apply to all countries and many countries interfere with Australia and in fact it should have been done a long time ago. I mean we have massive Israeli interference in our domestic politics, Serbian interference in our domestic politics, American of course. But when Turnbull announced it he spoke in Chinese and said uh, 
which paraphrases Mao standing on top of the uh, Tiananmen uh, uh, podium in 1949 when he said the Chinese people had stood up against and then the sentence goes on a hundred years of humiliation and oppression by foreigners so Turnbull linked what, what's almost wholly writ in China with what he was doing which was supposed to be non-discriminatory but he made it entirely and solely about China and the people in Beijing, I was in Beijing at the time they're just shaking their heads thinking you know what's all this about now, we've been the, 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 the most active busybodies around promoting the quadrilateral dialogue, the quad, mm. uh, involving the US, India, and Japan, which is effectively um, uh, to contain China. Yeah. Geographically. Uh, geographically, yeah. yeah. I mean, on every issue, the South China Sea, we had the loudest mouth on the South, side of China, on the South China Sea. You just run, and, and it's surprising that China did not respond. Um, earlier, it did respond from 17, 2017, and it basically froze high-level diplomatic relations. But it's only after we, we went way out ahead on the COVID call that they actually introduced economic coercion. Now, it doesn't justify the economic coercion. They shouldn't be doing it. It's wrong. But that's the world we live in. Equally, we should not have been the chief needler of China. We yeah. did not have to be there provoking them publicly. Everything we wanted to do, we could do. Ban Huawei, foreign, foreign interference law, uh, pressure on the South China Sea. But, we sh but the diplomacy has been a disaster mm -hmm. um, and, and reckless and has been an abject failure because we find ourselves in this current situation. So as yeah. I wrote recently in, the Australian, in my Australian uh, Financial Review column on this, the Australian media and the politicians uh, basically applauded Morrison's visit to Cornwall as one of four extra countries invited along for a short photo opportunity with the G7 as somehow implying solidarity with Australia's position. What it said to me is that of those 11 countries, only one, only one has its diplomatic relations frozen and only one has economic sanctions against it, and that's Australia. All the others have the same problems with China that we do. All the others have problems with foreign interference, with cyber, with Huawei, South China Sea. Everyone has the same issues, and, and human rights, Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, um, Hong Kong, they all have those issues, but only one finds itself in the position Australia is. So, the ineptitude of our diplomacy uh, has made us an outlier. So it, it, it corresponds also to their decreasing demand for our natural resources. Could it also, could it almost be explicable this way that, as, as you admitted, you know, we could have banned Huawei on perfectly legitimate grounds. Um, we could have done X, Y, and Z policy on perfectly legitimate grounds, but your, 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 um, your critique is that we didn't have to be so rambunctious about it and say to the world, look how brave and strong we are at defending your enemy. You know, we, we didn't have to go about it doing it that way. But it's interesting. If it's true that we did have a genuine reason to enact these policies, just take banning Huawei as an example, isn't that almost a part, isn't that almost a, a, a soft power risk? Because it could have gone the other way, right? Where China comes out as this really strong leader against China and therefore can perhaps gain more soft power in, in other nations because of it. It just turned out that it went the other way. Is it possible to explain it like that or does it just come down to incompetency in your eyes at the end of the day? Oh, well, I, I think it comes down to uh, uh, partly incompetency, partly an overweening desire because of insecurity to please the Americans and to be seen to be pleasing the Americans. Um, and I think, um, and, and, and I think what I've written about for years now, the capture of Australia's China foreign policy by the military, industri the military, the military intelligence um, defense establishment. So diplomats don't run the policy any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so say, take Huawei, for example. Why don't you ask me what, what are the alternatives? Well, one alternative is 
this was a, this was this this is a government tender. Government tenders are blind. You don't have to announce reasons why someone didn't win the tender. Mm-hmm. They were just not the right company. They were not competitive. Mm-hmm. Now the mm-hmm. subtext is that they're not the right company because you don't trust them. You don't yeah. have to bloody shout that out from the rooftops. Or as Scott Morrison did with his homeland security minister at the time, announce it in the parliament. You don't have to do that. Yeah. It, and, it, it and, kind and, of does come back to like this sort of nationalist urge. It's hyper patriotic. We're Australia. We, uh, we, we're going to take charge of our own destiny. No one else is going to sort of tell us what we can and cannot do. Well, if you, if, if, if you look at... Um, yeah, but no, it doesn't. I mean, it makes us uh, more... Uh, uh, more closely linked, as I say, glued to the hip of the United States. We don't have an independent foreign policy. That's the crux of the whole problem. Mm-hmm. And if you look at Turnbull's biography, after we banned Huawei, he rang Trump and basically said to Trump, you know, what a lot of good boys we are. We've banned Huawei comprehensively and we made a big noise about it. And, and Trump was taken back. You know, they hadn't expected it at that time. Mm-hmm. Sure, that was the direction things were going. But most other countries, you know, crept up on that issue in, in quite, you know, discreet and, 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 um, and, and nuanced ways. But we were completely uh, up front. Yeah. Provocative. To continue, to continue on this theme, uh, there was a great quote from the book which said, over the past 40 years, China had gone from a boutique foreign policy interest to a transforming world order and that Australia's foreign policy with China must now be based in realism. With the context of everything we've just said, can you explain what you mean by that statement and what our uh, foreign policy with China going forward you think is the best way? Absolutely, and I think um, the best advice we have received is, <laughs> is from the, um, the Singaporean Prime Minister just recently when our Prime Minister visited him on his way over to the G7 in Cornwall And quite publicly, Prime Minister Lee of Singapore said, um, basically, get over it. China's not going away. It's going to be a big dominant power in our region. Mm. Uh, They're not going to become like you, like Australia, and you're not going to become like them. So you're going to have to work out how to live with it. Really? I didn't see that. How did um, uh, Scott Morrison react? I don't think Morrison even understood the message. (laughs) And and, and there's so much spinning on that trip. It's, It's shameful how things are interpreted. But uh, no, I mean, that's, that's my message. That really is all that the last third of the book's about. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to live, learn to live in a world, not just with China, where China's the big shaper and driver of it, but in, a, in, in an order which we are totally unfamiliar with. We have had the luxury for our entire history of having a dominant power provide our security mm-hmm. and one with whom we share values and institutions and outlook. Yeah. Now we're going to have to work out in the United States. United States. Pax Britannica, Pax America. Mm -hmm. Now we have to work out how we're going to live in a world that's vastly different. And that's what the book's trying to help governments do in Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a new world order and the certainties and comfort of the past, we have to get it through our head and not coming back. The, it, you know, Trump wasn't a transitionary figure in this respect. As we're having this conversation, you know, the last U.S. troops have left Afghanistan, and um, and uh, uh, Taliban are taking over deserted Air Force bases. Mm. You know, this is not uh, a world in which the U.S. is going to. Um, they might not uh, provide the uh, same order as they have no, historically. Exactly, and, and yeah. provide global leadership in that way. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, before before I move on to just the last few questions, and I just want to thank you for being so generous with your time, but could you, um, we, we skipped over the dystopian part of the future um, in the Australia-Chinese relationship. So coupling it with your comment on realism, do you, could you describe the dystopia that you see? Okay. The dystopia is an order that's not led by a liberal power mm-hmm. with whose views and outlook we share. It is going to be a competitive, uh, well, it already is, a competitive multipolar order where we are going to have to learn to live and work with countries whose values we don't share, countries we don't like. Amazing. Nice. Uh, and, and, and you see some examples of that. So, interestingly, 
your enemy's enemy is your friend. You know, we've embraced, to almost an embarrassing extent, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But Vietnam is a one-party communist state with a terrible human rights record. Which other country in the region will that set of adjectives apply to? Yeah. But yeah. we've embraced Vietnam. So sure. that's, actually, that's actually what a realist would do. That is a realist response. Yeah. But, you know, we don't like President Duterte of the Philippines. Yet Philippines is a liberal, open democracy with a free media. They just happen to have a president that's a serial human rights abuser. Yeah. And we have almost no high-level engagement. And we have no, no close understanding of the Philippines at the most senior levels. Mm -hmm. Yet if we want a frontline state to push back against China, that's one we should be cultivating. So this is, these are real examples of what it's like to live in, a, in, the, in the dystopian future that I talk about. One, one memorable theme of the book, um, and the, you know, an entire sort of part uh, devoted to it as well, was the idea or the topic of security. So could you extrapolate why you think we live in the most dangerous part of the world and what you think an appropriate security mechanism uh, would look like? Okay. Well, great, and it's very appropriate to see you sitting in Stockholm to be asking that, that question. Um, um, yeah, well, look, you've got a um, you know, direct standoff, if you like, between three nuclear armed states in the region. I'm leaving India out of this. I, I also argue in the book that India is not part of East Asian uh, security mechanism. Okay. Uh, okay. India doesn't have the same security interests in East Asia than the others, but you've got uh, uh, U.S. nuclear weapons, Chinese nuclear weapons, Russian nuclear weapons. Um, there are many still unresolved territorial disputes. Japan, Russia, Japan, um, uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Taiwan with U.S. commitment to protect and defend Taiwan and China's uh, determination to, to make Taiwan part of, um, of China, again, to, to, to bring it back in. So that's enough. But then you've got the North Korean uh, issue with nuclear weapons of some sort in North Korea, uh, the divided peninsula, uh, and, and South Korea. So all of those are potential flashpoints, mm -hmm. and they all intersect in some way. And that's why I say it's the most dangerous part of the world. And that's why I then say it's incredible for all of that to be going on and we don't have any formal country, state-to-state -state security mechanism in the region. Mm -hmm. We don't have an East Asian uh, security mechanism in a formal sense uh, where we can talk state-to-state, -state, where, uh, where um, uh, procedures and protocols can be established to avoid accidents. Uh, to avoid escalation if accidents occur. We have none of that in East Asia. There's some of it bilaterally. I mean, US-China has some, but we, we don't have a mechanism. And uh, I think that would be a great area for Australian diplomats to put their effort into uh, trying to build some sort of security mechanism in the region. But you'll need a lot of political leadership. You'll need political leaders who understand the issues and are prepared to talk to other leaders about the importance of doing these things. There's clearly a necessity for it, um, but is there, a, is, is there a hunger and like a, a, a motivation to do it? Um, hard to say. Uh, back in the first decade of last century, in the, in the, in the noughties, uh, there was a thing called the Six Party Talks, which were to basically try and uh, uh, stop North Korea developing nuclear weapons and to open up North Korea to some extent. And that was Russia, the US, China, South Korea, North Korea. Um, and at the time, Condoleezza Rice, who was uh, National Security Advisor, I think, yeah, and then Secretary of State, uh, she was very keen on the idea that this six party talks would become the nucleus of an East Asian security mechanism whether it be more open, whether more countries would join or not. I mean, that as part of my job as Deputy Secretary in those days, I used to go around to all the capitals in the region after they met, pressing upon them uh, Australia's interest in being part of any sort of mechanism. Mm 
and how our security is so deeply tied and so deeply vulnerable to events or exposed to events in Northeast Asia. Um, and I know that when I came to China in 2007, excuse me, as ambassador, um, the Chinese were actually quite interested in this idea of an East Asian security mechanism. Um, now, I don't think anyone's really talked about it much because that all fell apart uh, when North Korea actually started to test nuclear missiles. Uh, the dynamics of the politics in the region have changed a lot. Um, you know, even US engagement has changed to some extent. Um, and it's hard. It's really hard. And I think one reason why it's not on any agenda at present is because people think it's too hard. But my argument would be that's precisely why a country like Australia should take it up. If you think it's worth having, it doesn't matter if the degree of difficulty is great and it's hard, then we have a, a, you know, we have a real role to do, it, to do it. It's in our interest because we're so, as I said, exposed to security in East Asia. Um, but it's in a, in a broader global interest. So I'd love to see us take that up as a return to uh, our more activist role in middle power diplomacy. Um, very interesting. And also something that I'd never really considered before uh, reading your book. I think one of the great, uh, one of the great sort of advantages or differences that your book has, rather than just being like a um, sort of worldview for the future, is it's from the eyes of a diplomat, you know? And so you can see things differently from the inside, obviously, like the, the notion of maybe a solution could be a, a security mechanism in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, didn't run by my, my head as an outsider, but would for an insider. So this is, this is something that I think is, um, you know, inescapable when you think about China, and that is the very well documented sort of human rights abuses. And obviously, they're not the only country in the world that does terrible things to their people, but um, that doesn't put anyone else off the hook. It's just, it's very well documented in China. And I'm speaking specifically about the uh, Uyghur population and also other ethnic minorities throughout the country. Um, so depending on what you read, what you hear, it can be as bad as um, concentration camps to as mild as simply, you know, uh, re-education, whatever that means. So from a diplomatic point of view, as a person who loves China, lives in China, but also has seen the workings of the government, how do you rationalize all of this? And what can we do about it to not just have an, uh, a visceral reaction to a a, a political movement party that would do this to people. Yeah, look, it's 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 very very hard, very hard, and particularly, well, any country is very hard. Whether it's whether it's you know Burma or Iran or or India, um, you know, it's it's hard everywhere to get um, countries to make progress on human rights conformance and respect unless somehow they see it in their interest to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't mean there's nothing to be done. And I think one thing though is they need to be unpicked. They're not the same. So the big ones in China of course are Xinjiang and Tibet and Hong Kong now. But they've got different origins and different reasons and it's important to understand that as well. Um, and specifically with respect to Xinjiang, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to believe the worst of it, although I don't have smoking gun evidence, but there seems to be a lot of stuff out there that um, would lead me to err on the side if it's an error of accepting the worst rather than um, uh, something much less. And, and so, the worst is a, an attempted genocide. Of an well, I wouldn't use the word because that's very loaded and it's got it's very loaded specific, I understand but if, if we know what the worst but, intentions are but the worst is you know um, uh, rounding up people incarcerating them for no reason other than they are uh, uh, Muslims and um, uh, re-educating them yeah uh, it, it, it could be an attempt to obliterate a, a culture it could be cultural genocide mm -hmm. If that's a understood concept, I'm not sure, but but um, that's what I'm prepared to do is to prepare to say, well, look, I, I don't want to. What I'm trying to do is not understate the enormity of what's happening. Sure, something big and bad is going on and has been going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm someone who's travelled to Xinjiang seven times, and I've got you know great Uyghur friends, and 
uh, I, I really, really love Xinjiang. It's one of my favorite parts in China. And I'm sad, very sad by what I see and hear. But I have no first-hand evidence, but I'm prepared, as I said, to, to go with the, um, the more serious uh, concerns. Now, that's a long way into saying I don't see this really as um, ethnically driven. It's targeted Uyghurs, but I think it derives from something else. Okay. And what it derives from, in my mind, is, and I talk about this in the book, is ancient concerns about peripheral security by Beijing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you haven't asked me about the title of the book, China's Grand Strategy. Its grand strategy is territorial integrity, holding it all together, uh, and maintaining the power of the Communist Party. And the two, of course, are both closely linked in the minds of the leadership in China. Um, and so this goes to the core of, of how the, the party leadership defines its existence. And with um, the US withdrawing from Afghanistan, the porous nature of the borders, uh, China's own behavior has encouraged, I think, a great sense of disassociation from mainstream hard society that probably has contributed to uh, potential um, threats to security in that area. Uh, I'm not arguing that the way they're going about it is the right way. In fact, I believe it's the wrong way and it will be counterproductive and will create the problem they're trying to avoid. But I just think it needs to be understood as the motivation needs to be understood as something different. It doesn't change the facts on the ground. I won't delay with going through all the others. But, but what do you do about these things? Well, there's not much. Um, but having you know, sweeping public condemnation of China by politicians doesn't get you anywhere. It just hardens the views. And I must say, you know, I've got Han Chinese friends uh, in Beijing who, without any prompting, uh, and are not, you know, party members, not the private entrepreneurs and so on, have zero zip tolerance for Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. Not because they don't like Uyghurs um, as an ethnic community or whatever, but they're angry about uh, what they see as very favourable policies in the past by the Chinese government and is, the lack of gratitude. Is, now, we is, can is argue someone, with a, Sorry to interrupt you, Jeff, but is that someone whose mind might have been warped by internal propaganda? Well... It's, hard, it's, a, good, it's, it's a good point. I mean, that, that, that's an ever-present reality here, propaganda, yeah. ever-present reality. But I sort of don't think so. I think... Yeah, your average, you, you find them in Australia sort of um, not very well educated, but, but um, uh, and I don't, when I say that, I don't mean they haven't gone to university, but they're not intellectuals, they're not academics, uh, whatever, who are business people who have made a lot of money uh, through their own entrepreneurial skills, mm -hmm. um, who um, uh, are not part of the party state, but think China is very successful, proud of what China's achieved and don't like to see people getting a free ride in their terms. Sure. And sure. you can think of many people you know in Australia who have that view. In to, every country. Or and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. The Swedes will say, uh, I mean, mm. in white company, obviously they won't, but they'll say the yeah. same about Polish immigrants, you know, the Americans, famously with the Mexicans. Yeah, I, I yeah, have a sense. Exactly. Like, that's what so, the dynamic. But, but in any case, I mean, what do other countries do about it? As I said, not much. We used to have an annual human rights dialogue, which I led for many years from in the, in the, in the 2000s. Um, I think that was okay. That helped bring up the issues. Um, I just think you have to keep arguing a consistent line on this, make your points clear, make them repeatedly. Um, there's no value in, in publicly uh, attacking, um, but uh, you need to have high level dialogue to be able to do that. And unfortunately, Australia has no official dialogue any longer. Mm -hmm. So we can't do that. Um, but also, I think we can have groups of countries. I think um, we could talk more with other Islamic states in the region. We could uh, engage more with Indonesia, for example, and see what Indonesia's doing, and if Indonesia's putting pressure on China, uh, and how we can help and assist. So there are many ways into this. It's not to excuse or apologise for the for what's happening, um, but it's trying to be smart and find ways. Again, as I said before, 
in diplomacy, it's not how loud you speak, it's about outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Try and find ways to get outcomes. But it's hard. It's sure, extremely hard. Sure. I, I, it's just now we're sort of coming to the end of it and, and I'm, and I'm, you know, the neurons are firing thinking about China and perhaps expo explanations for why diplomatic ties might be the way they are. And I'm thinking that, you know, maybe Australia's bravado can almost be part of a huge, a huge, uh, uh motivating variable that's been taken into account is the fact that there are these human rights abuses going on or the fact that there is well-documented, um, uh, cases of internal propaganda that is spreading disinformation about whether it's Australia, Europe, or America, and um, perhaps even the social credit scoring systems, which are also well documented. This like combination of of factors, which are just they run against maybe an Australian mentality, can can partly explain why our diplomacy has been uh, more hard handed than than soft handed. You know, um, is that a fair assessment? I don't know. I'm just trying to make sense of it. You know? No, but, but you've got to look at other countries. As I said earlier, we're an outlier. It, 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 all that is true for any other liberal Western democracy. Sure. Yeah, that's that's very true. Very true. We're, we're an outlier. Um, but I think you see, it's very interesting point you touch up, because our pol politicians have been very quick to try and politicise these sorts of issues domestically. Sure. And, and, and it's a big mistake to try and run foreign policy through the prism of domestic politics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, you know, for lots of reasons, but basically you, you usually end up not achieving any objectives that are worthwhile and harming yourself. It's a lose-lose. Interesting. Well, that uh, very, very fascinating inflection on it as well, because I do sort of think sometimes how how does one actually deal with these problems? Because you can go super hard line and just cut ties, which is either trade sanctions or or, 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 or whatever, or you um, can adopt the realism approach that you uh, you know you've explained in this conversation already, and maybe just realize that uh, well. We still need to have relations here, despite all these bad things that we don't like. There's like a, there's the realism to it. Um, well, Ryan, I, I can assure you on that that all those other countries, all the G7 and the four visitors there, uh, uh, of them, uh, not one, uh, despite saying they don't like economic sanctions, they say that because they're worried they might get hit them hit by them themselves. Yeah. Not one is stopping their wine exporters selling more to China because Australia is not selling more, or their barley exporters not selling more, or their timber, or, um, uh, or their coal exporters. Not one is in any way uh, limiting their exports uh, uh, because Australia's uh, exports have been blocked. In fact, the opposite, they're ramping up their sales to China to take advantage. That's the world we live in. Sure. Now, again, it's a matter like of just being realistic about these things. things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. I got one more for you, Jeff, and then two extremely yeah. quick ones. Which yeah, I should finish. Yeah, yeah. Is and I'll keep it very simple, uh, open for you to answer. Is what's happened to Hong Kong over the last few years a foreshadowing event for what's going to happen to Taiwan? Uh, no, because the circumstances are very different. Um, uh, really, I mean. Maybe in 30 years, something like that might happen with Taiwan, that domestically there will be a shift of policies in favour of Beijing, mm -hmm. but we're a long way from that. Uh, and in fact, I argue in the book that Beijing's got a big problem with Taiwan and Hong Kong, uh, in that it's, it's, it's lost the young generation, and that's a big problem. Yep. No, but Hong Kong is something different. Look, you had a transitionary agreement for 50 years, uh, which reflected the balance of power in 84 uh, when it was first negotiated uh, between the British and the Chinese and the Chinese were very very much weaker then um, I can assure you if you were doing it now you wouldn't have a 50 year transition period it would be very short if any at all um, but that reflected the circumstances of the time and pretty much it was followed um, but uh, 2047 was always coming and in 2047, um, this is what you could have expected to happen. Um, I, I, at the time, October 2019, I wrote in a couple of articles that what's happened is that 2047, to, 2047 
has been collapsed to the present in Hong Kong. And every country in July 97 cheered and applauded that Hong Kong was moving back to China. Well, this is the reality of Hong Kong moving back to China. It's been accelerated because of the demonstrations and the demonstrators burning the Chinese flag, calling for independence, all of that. Um, so basically it's all over Red Rover. The future has now collided with the present. But it's never going to be any different because we all accepted that Hong Kong was China's sovereign territory. The formula for Taiwan is quite different. Um, uh, the, t the formula says that you recognize one China. There are no commitments by others uh, to notions of sovereignty. Yeah. But equally in Hong Kong, if I could say, uh, I feel sorry, very, very sorry for um, people in Hong Kong and the change that's happened. Um, and I don't like it. And I think um, it's sensible and right and proper for governments like Australia to say things about it if they have got an opportunity to express their views to the Chinese. But I think from an Australian point of view, it is utterly counterproductive to join in with the Anglosphere, the so-called Five Eyes, and have an Anglo-Saxon beat up on China over Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. The only country with whom China has any, any treaty, any obligation with Hong Kong is the UK. Yeah. And the arrangements were put in place by the UK. No one else. And when we stand up the Five Eyes and criticize China over Hong Kong, all we're doing is helping the UK Conservative Party with its domestic political problems at this time. Yeah. And we're not doing anything in Australia's interest at all. Sure. But nonetheless, we, is, that's another example of something we might make a lot of noise over. Yeah. Um, look, Jeff, I, uh, that was really thrilling. Super uh, Thanks, uh, educative as well. And, and uh, you know, maybe it came through a bit, but I do really sort of romanticize this job that you had uh, back in the day and, and even currently, you know, in a position of influence in such a fascinating and important country in the world, I, I think is amazing. So these are two questions that I ask every single guest um, and answer them very quickly. But what country are you most bullish on going forward? It's a hard one. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd, I'd have to say uh, Australia. Fantastic. Good. That's the first uh, first Australia we've gotten. Um, and finally, if you could witness a conversation between any two people, say you listen to a podcast between them, who would they be, dead or alive? Oh, I don't think about things like this. Goodness gracious. Um, Oh. Well, I'd like to. I, I, I'd like to hear Franklin D. Roosevelt and Xi Jinping have a conversation. Okay, interesting. Uh, why was that? What, what would they speak about? Well, important leaders in the countries that are an important time of transition, um, and I think they should and could talk about how the US and China um, find cause for um, uh, you know, global good uh, mm -hmm. rather than global competition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, Jeff, what a pleasure. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers.